Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray with Let's Make Art and I teach watercolor tutorials. I do a new one every single week and this week we are doing the lighthouse. Ooh. Now you go, Aww. thank you. <laughs> um, there's a lot of steps to this one, but that's okay. We just take it step by step and we are going to do great. Michael is working the cameras. Hello. And he'll tell me where to look and where to put my paper and sometimes there. have put it there. Put it put it right there. Right there. <laughs> We're also married, so if we flirt with each other a little bit, that's why. <laughs> I was about to do a how you doing. How you doing? <laughs> okay. For this project, we are using two paint brushes. Our Princeton Heritage Series, round six and round two. We use these for like 90, 95% of all of our projects because it's just what I like to use and that way you guys don't have to use a billion brushes. But if you want to use more brushes, nothing wrong with that. Okay, the colors we are using, we're using five colors. So, our first color is yellow ochre. Our second color oh, is... I'm going to try to name them. Don't say them. Just spread them out and then I'll say it and then you say what the real name is. Okay. This one. Let's see. Uh, gray slate. Black. Black. Okay. Close. <laughs> All right. Next. We've got um, azure blue. Is it really? Yep. Yes. Okay. Kay. We've got uh, viridian. No. Uh, Norwegian forest. Emerald green. Emerald green. <laughs> I never would have got there. I know. Okay, last one. Do you want a hint? Survey says fuchsia. Nope. It's a flower. Sometimes they have monkey faces. Orchid. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yellow ochre, black, azure, blue, emerald green, and orchid. Um, we are going to do this lighthouse in six steps. So our very first step is we are going to do our water. Second step, we're gonna do our sky. Third step, we're gonna do the grass on the hill. Fourth step, we're going to do rocks. Fifth step, we're gonna do the building, buildings, cause there's two. And then the sixth step is just any last minute details that we need to put in there, okay? Six steps, that's it. I am going to do my outline and then the oath and then warm ups and then get into painting. Feel free to skip any of this, especially if you've been painting with us for a while. You probably know how. Don't skip the oath. Don't, don't, cheat. <laughs> don't cheat yourself. Don't cheat yourself of the oath. Okay, so for the outline, um, you can get this on our website for free. You just find the Lighthouse Project and download it. Or if you're a subscriber or order the kit, the outline should automatically be in there. I tape it to my watercolor paper and then I take my graphite paper, put it in between, dark side down, and whatever line I make on my paper, it will transfer onto the watercolor paper. And sometimes it's easier if you use a different color to trace because then you can see like what lines you've already done. And after I do my first mark, I always check to see how it transferred. And then that way I know if I need to adjust pressure or that it's even showing up. Because I can't tell you how many times I've traced something with this being upside down and then you're done and then there's nothing and you're like so mad at yourself. My problem is I push with the force of a thousand suns, so <laughs> my outline always shows up through the painting, which is fine. It's not a big deal, but a couple things that you can do to combat that is light pressure or to get a soft tipped marker instead of like a hard, like a pencil or Blick, Bic, Bic pen. What are those called? Yeah. Bic. Yeah. Um, it's a brand name. Yeah. They sponsor us, that's why I threw that in there. Yeah, send us free stuff. <laughs> um, they don't really. They don't. Are we allowed to say things like that? I, probably not. Probably, probably not. <laughs> I think that's like a, just lying. So you had mentioned in a previous tutorial that once you get water on the graphite, it's unmovable, correct? Correct. Is that just the deal Bob Graphite made with the devil to come up with this product or what? I why think is so. That? Just makes it permanent, huh? Yeah. So um, you can lighten the lines after you trace them. They will never fully disappear, even with an eraser. And then, um, sorry, I'm like 
doing two things at once. Um, so that's why you try and like trace lightly. I do it a little bit darker for this video so you guys can see. And I also want to point out that the thickness of what you're tracing with will inform the outline. So this is a thicker marker tip, even though it's naturally soft, but you can see my lines are pretty thick. That doesn't bother me. There's also, um, there's carbon paper, which is not the same carbon paper. I don't think you can lighten or erase at all. Um, because graphite is carbon. That's really funny. They named it that. Oh, are they the same? Probably. I don't know. Maybe they're like different levels of intenseness, but graphite is just carbon. Wow. I need to be more educated on the things I talk about. <laughs> No, maybe they're different. I don't know. I don't know either. I always assumed they were different. Because carbon paper is what people used to use like when they were type on like a typewriter, they use carbon paper to make copies. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that can erase. But I don't know. I've only used graphite paper. I mean, you, you can be carbon bonded like to other elements. If you're carbon bonded to yourself in a a square structure, you're a diamond, you're a carbon flying solo, you're graphite. What I really want is, and this might be a thing, so tell me if it is, but a piece of graphite paper, but instead of, it's like, instead of graphite, it's like a watercolor pencil. So then that way you can trace, and then if you use water, once that line, once that water hits that line, then that line disappears. So that would be nice. We should make that and get rich. Listen, if that is already in existence, please let us know. We'll look into that for the kids. If it is not, don't you take our idea. Yeah, we need this. <laughs> we need this. We have nothing. We need this. Please. I got to send my kids to college. Please. I got a third on the way. <laughs> I'm thinking, so like the quilt ladies have pens that disappear when you get them hot. You thought about that? I feel like I would have to iron my painting no, and I don't want to do that. They oh, duh. They don't need to get very warm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe. Listen, we got some good ideas. <laughs> we're going to make it big. <laughs> we're going to we're going to make it big. Okay. So, let's do our oath. If you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. Whenever Keenan does the oath, he goes and I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. And then I do this. And then they do a little twinkle. You think you have something special with Keenan. I have something special with Keenan. <laughs> Listen, everybody Kenan's has something my special with Keenan. He's my buddy. <laughs> okay. Warm ups. So, a few things I want to go over. Uh, one of them is value. We go over this every single painting, and that's because it's extremely important. Value is the lightness and darkness of a color. There are some colors that are naturally a lighter value and some colors that are naturally a darker value, but you can still get a range of value in each color. In watercolor, if you want a lighter value, you want to just grab a little bit of paint. So if I'm doing a lighter value, I'm going to dip my brush in the water, get it wet, hit it off the side of the cup, actually the bristles on the side of the cup. Don't just do this, that's not enough. You gotta actually hit it. And then you grab a little bit of paint, and here's a light value. Girl, that's a light value. Yes, it you is. It. Now, I usually like my butcher tray ceramic palettes, but we're in the process of moving offices, and I couldn't find one. So I'm using um, this tray. You can use so many different things for a palette. I would suggest maybe using glass or um, ceramic or something over plastic because plastic, the paints tend to bead up a little bit, um, but it's not the end of the world. Like you can still use it. I used to use uh, Tupperware lids actually and dinner plates. And whatever else was laying around. And literally anything else that was Our laying whole house around. Was covered in paint. <laughs> you just want to make sure that it's white underneath. If you get a palette that is um, a darker color or any color, it will throw off the colors that you're mixing on your palette. Your eye won't be able to tell what color that is. I was fine when you painted on everything because my life got exponentially cleaner when you switched from oil to watercolor <laughs> as yes. your primary medium. Yes. 
Oil, I was a complete and utter mess. I just felt like I had a headache all the time. It was just like oily smelling. It was. It's very uh, pungent. Pungent to all the different chemicals. Okay. And then to get a darker value, I would fully dip my paintbrush in that puddle of paint and paint with that. So here is the same color, three different values. And there's lots of values in between too, but this is just um, your base. Okay. The next thing that we are going to go over is we are using a sponge in this tutorial. This is a sea sponge. It was the bonus item in your subscription box if you're a subscriber. Um, we're going to do it for two different techniques. So one of them is we are going to pick up a little bit of paint to do some, this is how we do the splashes, the wave splashes right here, is we're just going to do this, that, that's it. And then we actually use it um, for the sky as well. So for that, I'm just going to practice doing these kind of swoops here. Wow, that's a nice swoop. <laughs> Isn't it a good? That's a good swoop. <laughs> and then if you want, so you can see here that we have some strong lines going on, which is also in my painting. So it's kind of nice to have that texture. If you want it to be a little bit more smooth, then you're just going to pick up a bit more water. Now, and squeegee off the extra water because sponges, you know, soak stuff in. Okay, I'm sure someone's thinking this. Yeah. I'm thinking it. Yeah. You used that sponge previously in yeah. another project. Do you have to, like, wash them thoroughly? Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Thank you. There is color on this already, but I rinsed this thoroughly to where um, it was clean. Will soap mess them up? Should you use I used water? soap on that to see if it would take the color off. Okay. Um, it did not because these are dyes. So it dyed the sponge, but the sponge was clean. Okay. So I don't know if it's bad to use soap on them. I would just use water. Okay. Because I don't think the soap actually got rid of the extra paint because it was pretty clean before. Um, I just wanted to see if I could like change the color of the sponge. So even if your sponge is multicolored, it can still be clean, just rinse it. Okay. And I picked up a little extra water so you can see now I have a smooth line compared to this one, which is a little bit more textural. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So um, you can use that knowledge to your advantage. Win Jeopardy. <laughs> How do you achieve a lighter swoop? What is more water, less pressure? More water. And then on the, the lights go off and it's like bing, 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 bing. And they're like, you did it. You're so smart. You're the smartest person in the history of Jeopardy. Okay. Last technique is we're going to practice thin lines because we have some detail work on our. Um, buildings. So I'm going to switch to my round two. And um, when you do thin lines, you want to make sure you do a vertical hold, which means your paintbrush is straight up and down. And what I like to do is I pick up paint. And even though this is a small brush, sometimes if you have it too wet or have too much paint, it's going to make a thicker line because of the amount of water and paint that's in there. So what I like to do is I get my brush wet, I hit it off the side of the cup, I pick up some paint, and then I actually flatten one side and turn it and flatten the other side. It kind of pinches my bristles together, and then I do my thin lines. Vertical hold, light pressure. Girl, you're so good at thin lines. Thank you. You're a thin line master. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm talkative today. It's I'm, okay, I I'm like it. Kathy. Listen. I like it. Hey, the uh, property of the plastic trays you're talking about makes the water beat up? Yeah. That's called hydrophobic. What Does that go away over time? No. It's probably because what they're made of, plastic, mm -hmm. is a polymer and they're usually like a hydrophobic thing. It mm -hmm. might, if it gets little scratches in it, mm. surface area changes, it'll go away. But mm -hmm. For the no, most part? For the most part, no. Okay. Now, we're mainly doing this for the house details, so these are pretty short lines. They're not going to be super long. So you can just practice that. The nice thing about round brushes is you can also get really thin lines with your um, six because it has that same point. So you can try it. Sometimes, honestly, even like round, this is a round 10. I can get a really nice thin line with That's a round a thick 10. Brush. Yeah. So don't always think that the smallest is the best way to go for thinnest. It just depends on the type of brushes you have and test them out. So this is my six thin line. It just takes a little bit more control. Okay, Desert Island. 
one brush, what is it? Ooh, probably a six. You think so? Well, I think it also depends on like the size of my paper. The paper you crashed on the desert island with? Yes, because <laughs> if it's like I only have 18 by 24 sheets or something bigger, I would go with a bigger brush, but still around. If I only have like five by seven sheets, I would do a six or smaller. Okay. Let's get to painting. <laughs> the longest intro. I'm sorry. It was all my fault. <laughs> it's okay. I do want to mention that the outlines that you guys get are eight and a half by 11 and the paper that you guys receive are nine by 12. So I don't know if you've noticed this before, but the outlines never go to the edge of that page. We do that on purpose because nine by 12 frames are actually really hard to find. It's easier to find eight and a half by 11 or eight by 10 frames. So I usually will still paint on a nine by 12 and just trim it down to frame size. I'm also gonna get another cup of clean water because you wanna make sure you have clean water for your sky. And let's get to painting. So the first thing that I'm going to do is do my water. So. I'm gonna mix a little bit of my azure and a little bit of black because this azure is very vibrant and I wanna kinda of tone it down just a little bit so it's not so much. Okay. And then I'm going to get rid of the excess water on my sponge from the warm up. Also have paper towels. I always use paper towels or you can use like cloth towels if you don't wanna waste paper towels. Um, handy because you always need something to like dry your brush on or any, it's just a handy tool to have. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up some color and you can always test it on a sheet before you put it on your paper if you want. And then kind of right here in this area I'm going to do some dots, just a little bit. And I'm what I'm trying to make is like the waves crashing. So there's a lot of white foam and there's also water in there. So we're trying to actually paint the little water spurts that are coming out and leave a lot of white space for the foam of the water. The foam has a name. I think it's flotsam or jetsam or something. Funny. Yes, it does. Yeah. So that's all I'm going to do right there. That's it. Okay. And then I'm going to switch to my six. And your painting's done. <laughs> You're done. Congratulations. <laughs> it's a work of art. Okay. Now I'm going to grab my six and put the rest of the water in. Just remember to avoid this area. Basically, you want to leave a good chunk of that white. Because the nice thing is you can, if you leave too much, you can always go in and paint more. If you paint too much it's really hard to erase in watercolor so don't so so you know just do a little bit okay <laughs> so i'm just going horizontal across for the water now to communicate depth over um over space is you change the value so the back part of our water I just use paint and then as I work my way forward, I'm gonna use mostly water to spread the color that I already laid down. We don't want this to be one even value. And then I'm, now as I'm getting down here, I'm gonna avoid this white area like so. So I obviously think of you as like the Superman painter. You can paint anything, but in your head, what do you feel like you're scared of painting, like you're not good at or like it's too hard? Is there anything? Uh, yes, actually. I am actually not really great at uh, landscapes, which is funny because that's what we're doing. <laughs> I think your landscapes are top notch. Well, thank you. But it's, um, I feel really comfortable painting animals and people and florals. I struggle a little bit more with, um, with landscapes. And I think a lot of that is has to do with the materials that I'm using. Landscapes and watercolor, when you're doing full landscapes, it's traditionally better to use a thicker paper that's 100% cotton, because um, it will hold up to that amount of water and paint. Hmm. 
Um, and because I prefer the Canton and the liquids, they just, they lend themselves better to like a single item on a paper than the entire thing painted. You know what These I mean? Are problems I never would have thought about. I'm glad yes. I asked. Um, and then if you want to do like an extra layer to kind of darken far away, you can do that. I'm going to do another. Now, where the water meets the rocks at the edge here, we'll go back in and clean that up after we put in our rocks. So this is what it is supposed to look like, okay? And it might seem a little unfinished, but that's okay, we'll go back in. So there's our water. Now we are going to do our sky. So I'm going to actually mix a little bit more black over here with my blue, because I want this to be like, a very uh, gray overcast sky where it's just lots of clouds, lots of layers of clouds that kind of swoop. So I want this to be a little bit more gray than blue. I struggle with these uh, palettes because there's no room for mixing. Okay. This lighthouse looks very Fort Braggy to me. Yeah, that's what I was feeling too. In California and Fort Bragg, um, Michael's family goes there for vacation and it's very um, like overcast and chilly but it's right next to the ocean it's, the it's so beautiful it's my favorite place okay so I picked up some gray and you can test it on the paper you can test the value on your warm-up paper before you take it to your painting I feel good about that color and the value Oh, I used it all up. Okay, I'm pick up more. And I'm just gonna swoop and swoop over here. When I was much younger, I was convinced that you could tell which coast a lighthouse was on by which direction the water was. Like if the water's on the left, it's on the west coast. Oh yeah. The water's on the right, it's on the east coast. <laughs> and then I realized that you could just turn. lock your camera <laughs> and turn around. Okay, just one thing I want to show you guys. I was picking up black and I accidentally picked up green that was on the side of my uh, little circle here. So I am going to be really careful now um, because I don't want green in my sky. So I'm actually going to flip my sponge around so that way I know I'm avoiding the green. Okay. Okay, and that blue is a little bit too, and that's okay. You just grab a little bit more gray and you can just do a layer right on top to tone down that blue. You see those pictures of like, I don't know, somewhere up north and it has like that glowing blue ice. It's like super clear, super blue. That's what that color reminds me of. Mm, yeah, I can see that. Now, one thing I want to point out to you, um, how we can also communicate space in a sky, is that farther away, the layers of clouds get closer and more compact together. So up top, that's why we have these big swoops. And then as we work our way down the painting, we're trying to communicate that it's going back in space. And how we do that is making the clouds and the swoops smaller and closer together. So when I do these swoops down here, That's why they're kind of more on top of each other. And if you want to make them a little bit more textural and gray, I'm going to do that. And if you get a little bit into your lighthouse, it's not a huge deal. Try to avoid it if you can. I just want a few rougher textures in the gray, so I'm still gonna, too dark, so I'm just gonna work it till it's lighter. Did you have this idea after you watched that Willem Dafoe movie? <laughs> I don't wanna talk about that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it did give me that same <laughs> vibe. <laughs> okay, don't forget the right side of the lighthouse either. I love like paintings with a lot of negative space like this because 
I can't see it until it's almost done. So, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I love when it just like pops and you're like, oh yeah, it's a, it's all together. Yeah. That's what's really exciting about these waves when we're done. Like this white foamy wave will yeah. pop more and you'll be like, oh, cool. Oh, cool. Cool. <laughs> okay. Okay, I feel good. So these clouds are really like soft and billowy to me. They're kind of, that's what they're reading. Is that how they're reading to you? I think it's a nice stratus layer, yeah. Okay, great. So that's it for our sky. Congratulations, we did step one and two, and now we're moving on to step three. We're gonna do the grass. So you can do the grass in a few ways. Um, you can use just your paintbrush. I also use my sponge on this too. You don't have to, but I'm gonna show you how I did it. So- the sponge is getting a lot of love. This sponge is getting a lot of love. So I'm gonna mix some green in the center of my palette with a little bit of black and a little bit of ochre because I want kind of like a dead grass feel. <laughs> but you guys are free to do whatever color you, you want. You know what ochre, what is ochre? I keep thinking of okra. What do you think ochre is? Like, I don't know what you're asking me. Oh, like where they got that. Yeah, is okra, is ochre? <laughs> no, I'm confused. I'm gonna look it up. Let me see what ochre is. Okay, you do that. So. I got my ochre and a tiny bit of green and a little bit of black. And I'm going to start putting in the grass. I'm going to start with horizontal lines. And if you want to do drops of ochre in there, maybe some have stronger greens. Ochre, definition, the color of ochre. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miriam Webster. And then what I did to kind of help me um, get a shape for my cliffs is after I put in this like grass, sorry, I want it to be more yellow. So I'm gonna drop in some more yoker. I said yoker, <laughs> ochre. And then I took my sponge, make sure you're using a cleaner edge. And then I just kind of like wanted to follow the angles of the mountains. And you can see that in the step-by-step -step that I did here, where I swooped at an angle down, like so. It kind of helps me define my shapes. And also like sometimes grass works its way down the mountain edge as well. There's like tufts of bushes or things like that. So that just kind of helped me um, sh go for the shape. Does that make sense? Like define the shape that you're painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just say yes, thank you. All right, surveys in about the name ochre. Okay. It's derived from the Greek word okros, which means yellowish. Oh, great. <laughs> All very helpful. It's made of iron. Okay, so there is my grass, and that was step three. We call that a grassy knoll? <laughs> yes. Okay, now we're gonna move on to step four. We're gonna put in like our rocky edge. Now, one thing I want you guys to keep in mind during this part, and if this might be really frustrating to you, and I'm sorry, but I'm just gonna warn you that this is how it goes. We're being really random with color and with value. We're gonna leave random white spaces and kind of do some wet and wet. Um, there's not gonna be a formula to this where I'm like every two thirds, make a little jagged edge and then drop in some water and move on to the next. That's not how it works. You kind of have to like let go and be a little bit messy and not overwork it. It's so scary. And it's scary to like let go and just be like, okay, I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing. But that's how you're supposed to feel. I feel that, Channel so it's your okay. Inner Anna, no Elsa. Let, let it go. It go. <laughs> oh my gosh! Look how blue my hands are from that sponge. That's funny. <laughs> I wonder how long they're going to be like that. <laughs> well, we know soap doesn't take it off. So okay. So for the rocks, I'm going to mix some black. Now I want to mix like a warmer brown. So to do that, I'm going to actually mix a little bit of my orchid with my green. And look at that gorgeous brown I got. That's great. And then I'm going to start put putting in, I'm going to first follow kind of where these ledges kind of stick out. Like 
like so. Then I'm going to use just water and start spreading the brown. But you'll see that I'm picking up my brush because I don't want it to be an even smooth value. And then when it's still wet, I'm gonna go back in and drop in some stronger color. And the reason why we're doing this is because rocky edges have lots of different um, facets. Is that the right word, facet? Yeah. So, be yeah, so because they have so many different edges and facets, the light is hitting all of those things differently, which is why there is such a range in value. And that's what we're trying to communicate is this is not a smooth surface. Now, when we get down to this part right here, this is kind of where it like angles and then flat, like evens out with the water. I also like to drop in some yellow ochre in there too to make it like yellowy, yellowy. <laughs> Sorry, people, I'm changing the microphone battery. So you're just going to kind of repeat that process across the entire rocky edge. Now the other thing is kind of right where the rock is meeting the grass at the top here, it's gonna be a little bit darker value. So I'm gonna put another strong layer of dark value right there. Okay, drop in some all right, can you hear me again? Yes, you can. Okay. I'm like, they're not, this isn't live. I'm listening. <laughs> I'm like, they can't, if they say yes, you can't hear them. The thing that's funny about these microphones and Rode, please contact me, but they will show three battery bars, like they're full, and there'll be three batteries for days and days and days, and then and in then the space all of, of 10 sudden... minutes, they go like three, two, one, zero. Oh, dang. Wow, are you talking trash about a company on our... No, Rode, send me free stuff. <laughs> Sponsor us. Sponsor and then we'll me. say nice things about awesome. you. <laughs> I do love these microphones, though. We we'll use them in the other studio, too. Okay. So now I have my... Starting to get my rocky edge. And then as I make my way down here to the bottom, I'm going to go horizontal. Again, leave some white edges, white spaces. And then as it gets closer to kind of the water, I went for more of a darker Dang, I went value. away for 10 seconds. That looks so good. <laughs> and if you're feeling stressed out, step away from your painting and come back to it. It's always better to underwork it and then come at it with fresh eyes than to overwork it, overwork it, overwork it, and then like get super mad at it and you end up throwing it away. You got to take a step back from your painting sometimes. Same with bread making. Is that true? I don't know. Well, you do make bread. Do you have to do... I mean, I feel like when you fuss over things in general, they tend to come out worse, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. When you just kind of like, yeah, this is going to be however it turns out. Yeah. Then you're happy with the outcome. It's less pressure. Okay, I'm dropping in some dark values there. That brown is so good. Isn't that a good brown? Yeah. Orchid green, a little bit of black. It's like coffee. Yeah, that's a good... I used to paint with coffee. Coffee. Okay. And I'm gonna darken actually some of these over here. This was a little bit too smooth looking over here. I mean, obviously now you have children and a family and stuff, but pretend that you didn't. Uh -huh. Would you ever do a stint as a lighthouse keeper, just in solitary? I don't know. I think it depends on how long it was for. Mm, that makes sense. Because if it was like two weeks, yeah, I could probably do that. But if it was like three months, just go crazy. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if you can tell by the, how much I talk. I'm a social person. <laughs> a butterfly. <laughs> okay. And then I didn't really finish the grass in this corner, so I'm just going to go and put that in there. Oh, that was black. I meant to pick up. What inspires your projects? Just like what's going on in your life? And you're like, 
I know I was joking about the Lighthouse movie, but did that actually, were you like, I just feel like being a Lighthouse. Actually, we had a lot of requests for Lighthouses, which is why I did it. And then we were kind of doing like, then I thought it would be kind of fun to kind of do like a sea themed, which is why we have a narwhal and seashells in the book. So sometimes I do themes um, within the boxes and sometimes I don't. I try and pay attention to what people are asking to learn, and that's what I try and implement with the projects, and then have complementary ones that go over different techniques, um, or are loose, or are layered. So, like, so if you order the box, you have a full range. It's not all hard projects. It's not all easy projects. Yeah, because there's going to be some things that are much easier for you just naturally. Some people are really good at looser paintings. Some people do so much better with structured paintings with lots of layers. It just kind of depends, so I want to make sure that you guys have the opportunity to try all of them and then see what you feel comfortable doing. You could paint while you answer this, but like, what about your personal projects? Is it just, I don't know, I, I guess as someone who's not a professional artist and just watches professional artists a lot, mm -hmm. me, I'm very interested in the, the idea stage of creation, mm. you know, like what, what inspires you to make things just for you? What do you, is it reading or is it just everything? Uh, I think inspiration is a really tricky thing. And for me, there's not like a set formula of like, if I go outside and I turn a circle three times and I watch this video and listen to this song, I'm perfectly inspired. It doesn't work like that for me, but a lot of things inform it. And what I have found is I get really excited um, to create when I see other people being passionate about whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. So like, do you remember that one time we watched that show where that guy built his house yeah. with his family? Oh my gosh, that was so nice. Uh, everything was homemade and it was beautiful. I mean, it took him like 30 what, like years, 30 years. <laughs> yeah. but like the house was so gorgeous and handcrafted and unique. And he took his time on every little detail. And like for me, after watching that, I was just like, I need to go paint something because like, it just reminds me of the joy I have when I make. Mm. And then... I wish I knew what the title of that show was. I know, was it was nuts. so good. Okay, that so we did... Extreme Homes. I'm sorry. I, I think it was Extreme Homes. I think you're right. Okay, so we put our rocks in. If you guys... Um, now that I'm looking at it, if I want a little bit, like, blacker parts, so I'm just going to put those in. You might not need this, so don't stress if... Um, if yours has a good amount of dark edges and you're like, no, my painting doesn't actually need this, then you don't have to do this part. Okay. That looks so great. Thank you. Now we're moving on to the buildings. Um, this is where I would suggest maybe switching to a round six just because these are small little buildings. Now, the lighthouse itself is white, but even white things have form and therefore they have different values on them. So I kind of just use like a grayish color for the lighthouse. So right underneath the edge here, I'm gonna put that gray color in. And I can hear the trash truck outside the door. That, that, <laughs> that is loud. Last time, um, I think last week we were filming and they were working constructions upstairs and it was so loud. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm sorry, but we have to do this. It's where we live. Okay, so I'm just, I put the darkest value at the top and then I'm just using water. That's amazing. To spread it. And it just gives us a little bit of form. The edges were, are going to be a slightly darker value because again, it's a round object and so the it, the light is turning away from us what's happening up there <laughs> I'm trying to break in yeah that looks like the ghost of a lighthouse like the lighthouse's spirit is trying to tell you something <laughs> don't hit the rocks okay now i'm going to do kind of a green blue rim if you guys have red i know that red is also a really common color on lighthouses so if you want to do red instead you can so it's just going to be a green edge here i made it a little lighter value at the top at the front 
with using water and then on the back part I'm going to make it a darker value. Are you on the uh, side cam, Michael, the close-up, so they can see this? Uh, sure. Okay. Just they all three record all the time. Oh, okay. I just wanted, okay. But Chris, we'll, we'll or... make sure that they see this. Make sure you do the close-up on this. And then also the little doorway. So this is the roof. And then it has like, I don't know how to describe this, the posts around the door. Does that sound about right? Uh -huh. The door frame. The frame. And if you want to do a little doorway in there, you can. I did a little bluish one. Okay. There's a little window on this lighthouse, so I'm just going to do the hint of something sticking out from our lighthouse, which is just a darker value. I'm not going to do all four sides. I'm just going to do like two and then half of a third one right there, just to give the slightest hint of something poking out. And then this is where our thin lines are coming in. We have a little kind of grate thing on the top here. And uh, we're going to do this one using cross hatching. If you don't know what cross hatching is, it's when you do lines one way and then the opposite way. It is a technique in drawing too. And I just did that to make it look like fenced in, like a great, great? Lattice. Lattice. It what looks am like I that saying? stuff people put under their porch. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Or like let things grow up the side of. Okay, and then there's a little roof on the top of this, and to make it three-dimensional, the, the underneath part is going to be a darker value here. And I'm going to let that dry for a second. And then the top part is going to be a lighter value. Okay, so I'm going to leave that for a second before I do the top part. And I'm going to move on to the little house next to it. And I just switched up the colors on this just for, um, to make it easier to dif differentiate between the two buildings. You don't have to do that. You can change the colors however you see fit. But I did a brown roof on this. And this is such a small area that we're coloring in or painting in that it's a little bit harder to um, show dimension, um, but what I did to kind of help that is I just, um, on this part, this roof part that's sticking out here, because it's like angling out, I'm going to make that a lighter value. But I'm not going to do that yet because it will just bleed out, so give that a second. We can put in the door frame on this. Did you ever flirt with the idea of uh, being an architect? Me? Yeah, I feel like you'd be good at it. You think so? Yeah. You have a great eye for design, you know? Oh, thanks. No, I've never once thought about being an architect. I feel like there's a lot of math involved, and I feel like I had to take high school geometry twice. So... <laughs> take back everything I said. Uh. I've taken a math class with you. I didn't think you were terrible. Well, I did better when I was in college because I tried. Is that bad? <laughs> Ooh, maybe I should. Ooh. Mom, I'm sorry if you're watching this. I swear I tried in high school. <laughs> okay. And I'm just kind of using a gray on the side of the building here. I like to do the, the like edges, and then I just use water to kind of blend it out. Blend it out, bro. Like that. You can use more of an orchid with a tiny bit of the brown to get kind of like a brick color a little bit for the um, chimneys. Does this house have two chimneys? Yes. It's really cold. Because I felt like it. <laughs> so one's a bathroom vent and one's a fireplace chimney. You guys can make your chimneys however you want though. Okay, so again, to kind of um, 
give this house just a little bit more dimension. I'm gonna do a darker value here. And then kind of where this comes out, I'm gonna leave that lighter. So it just shows a little bit sticking out. Can you see that? Does it seem like it's sticking out a little bit more oh, now? Yeah. And then a little black door. Like so. And now we can go back to the top of our lighthouse and I'm just gonna use the existing color that's already there. So I'm just gonna get my brush wet, hit it off my paper towel or the side of my cup. And just drag this color to the top here. And there's a little, little bell, little dot on top, little circle. Hey, little buddy. Like so. Okay. That's looking good. I feel like this side of the door frame on my lighthouse needs to be a little bit darker. So I'm gonna do one more kind of greenish layer here. Okay. Do, 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 do. That looks good. If this, for me, sometimes when I do this kind of lattice on um, grates, sometimes it's like <laughs> lattice on grates. I don't know why I keep on saying grates. Lattice work on this fence thing. Sometimes <laughs> if it's too um, perfect, it bothers me because how our eyes and how the lights work is you wouldn't, there wouldn't be an even hole, like light hole across this entire thing because it's round. Does that make sense? So um, what I do sometimes is I just go in there and I mess some of it up to kind of help, to kind of give that more natural feel of like, no, 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 because it's curving, because there's shape to it, because there's light hitting it at different angles, um, it's not gonna be perfectly patterned. So you kind of mess it up a little bit so it's not like flat. You know who else does this? Hmm. Japanese sword makers. Really? They don't like when things are perfect. I just watched a documentary about it. And so like if they make a blade that's too nice, they'll just like put a chip in it somewhere on the back so it's just like it's not perfect. Wow. They just like it better. Well, I feel like that's what I do sometimes. Yeah, where I'm like, that's I exactly just... what this is, yeah. Okay. Now we're moving on to step six where we're just gonna put in like our finishing details. Mainly it's gonna be around this kind of water edge here. So I'm gonna put in some rocks. You can see that we have some like um, rocks that are separated from this rocky edge. You could sell those paper towels. That thing is gorgeous. This right here? Yes. Yeah, that's pretty. It has some metallic leftover too from what I was painting. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple rocks coming out of the ground here. And they're going to be kind of lumpy. Like so, you guys can decide how many you want to do. Like that. Okay, now, I just want to point something out to you. Our brain likes to do patterns. It's something that it naturally does on its own. It's great for when we're looking at things because then it makes it easier for our eyes and our brains to um, kind of figure out what we're looking at but it makes it difficult when we're painting because your brain is automatically gonna make patterns without you noticing it. For example, I have a rhythm going on here with the length of these rock growths going out and where they're placed. See how it's like boop, 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 boop? Uh-huh, boop, boop. It's too patterny. So when you see your brain doing that and your brain is just gonna do that naturally, you have to fight that and you have to be like, this is too evenly placed across here to, um, be natural. So you got to go in and you got to mess it up. So you're telling me to not paint with my brain, but to paint with my heart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. Now, doesn't that feel a little bit more natural? Oh, yeah. That edge? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just saying your brain is going to automatically do that on its own. Don't get mad at it. It's just its brain doing its thing. Um, just, just adjust it once you see it. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is if my rocky edge is dried, I'm gonna go in and put in some water touching it because the waves are kind of crashing on this part right here. And then even when waves crash, there's a little bit that seeps through and hits the edge. 
So I'm going to paint some of this water coming through and hitting the edge here. I'm constantly surprised by how great of a painter you are. It blows my mind. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Okay. And then... It makes all you feel good, feel better out there in watching land. She's not good at painting a room, though. Painting a, like a bedroom, like yeah. a house painting? Yeah. It's what, too short. When have I ever done that? <laughs> Touche. <laughs> You've always painted our house. She's, she's not good at helping me paint bedrooms. There we go. <laughs> okay. And now at this point, I can decide, like, do I like the amount of foam that I have going on here? And for me, I, I want to, like, bring it in just a little bit. So I'm going to, I'm also going to, like, add some kind of wave lines here. So just using my two and um, a darker value. I'm just gonna put in a little bit as if there's like, you know, waves in the water. I'm looking at your little card. Did you tape the edges of that? This? Yeah, to get such a clean... Um, or is that just magic of digital? Because I think this would look cool with like tape let edges. Me look at, let me look at my... Yes, I did. You can see here my taped edges here to get a clean line. So if you want a clean line, dang it. It's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just looking I'm at sorry. it I'm <laughs> sorry, I didn't say this earlier. <laughs> if you want a clean edge, you can tape off to get a clean edge. <laughs> Gosh dang it. It's fine. Last step of the painting, by the way, go back. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> you can actually probably, depending on how far you work down, you can probably... Um, I don't know if you can, but for me personally, I also like an imperfect edge that kind of like floats off into nothing. But that again is um, it's your Japanese heritage. It's preference. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna go in and kind of like. Nicole's laughing at us. I'm sure. Probably. Um, tighten up my foam area a little bit more. And by that, I mean I'm going to put more blue in my water. Now my rock hit that water and it's kind of bleeding out. I don't, I don't stress about things like that because, frankly, I think it just adds cool texture. And you can't get mad at watercolor for, like, doing what it's supposed to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then if you feel like you need to, you can put a little bit more... A little bit darker sprays in here, if you feel like you need it. I did a little bit. Oh yeah, that feels good. You know what I love about the ocean is like, it's so big. And when you stand by it and a wave crashes and it like shakes everything, you're just like, dang, there's yeah. a lot of power in there. I didn't realize how strong like water was until when we lived in Hawaii. Oh my gosh, yes. Because you see like, I feel like you see pictures of people like, surfing and you're like oh that that's cool whatever blah 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 and then you see the waves in person and you, you feel the ground shake when they crash oh. and those are like i think we only saw like 10 foot waves is probably the yeah, highest i've they're, seen but they're so big they're in life. so big and strong where it's like it would kill me if oh, i was yeah. in that water especially if there's like a reef and it crashes yes. into a reef it yes. is i just after like seeing that and witnessing that and the sheer power and weight that water has, it's like this whole new respect for surfers too, because you're like, some of those are like 30 foot waves. Do people die out there all the time? I know, and I understand because it's like, yeah, it, I don't, that's great. Okay, focus, focus, focus. Okay, I'm just doing one more layer of blue on my water here. There's such a huge disconnect between like being a beginner surfer and like someone who does that to yeah. me because like, yes. I'm a beginner surfer and I fall, I've surfed in safe spots on tiny, tiny waves. Yeah. I just don't know how you get to that point where you're like doing a 40 foot. <sighs> I don't know either. <laughs> it is amazing. These guys are crazy. Okay. And then, so I feel really good 
And but this is the time where you like take a step back and you're like, okay, what else? And I feel like I left actually too many white spaces on my rocky edge. And that's not a problem because I could just go in and get rid of some. So that's why it's always kind of good to err on the sh side of like leaving too many because then it's like, okay, just paint over them. Could you come back to this painting a week later and use some water and darken up those spots? Or is yes. it too dry at that point? Nope, you can absolutely go back a week later um, and work on it. Cool. Okay. Take that oil paint. <laughs> Actually, oil painting, you can absolutely. Take that acrylic paint. Oil paint wouldn't even be dry a week <laughs> later. <laughs> Um, and then just something if you guys want, if like your sky is bothering you and you just want a little bit more color, like just make sure your brush is clean and you can like try and spread out some of like this gray blue color. If you just didn't get it in all the places that you want. So you can play with this too. You guys can decide what you need to do for your painting but just because we use the sponges in one area doesn't mean we're not allowed to like use a brush in that same area. Okay, we're done. Sarah, it's so good. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. Um, this, admittedly, this was out of my comfort zone. I've never painted a lighthouse before, but I hope as, as I was learning, I was, it was good because then I was like mentally paying attention to problems that I ran into. So hopefully I addressed some of those while you guys were doing this. Um, if you painted this, I want to see it. You can tag us at, on Instagram at let's go make art or hashtag let's make art. We have a wonderful Facebook community. That's just for the sole purpose of you guys just sharing your artwork, seeing how you guys are, um, approaching projects or um, asking questions and you know it's just a great community that's called let's make art watercolor and if you need any of these supplies or if you're interested in the subscription box that I talked about you can find all of that information at letsmakeart.com that's all I got to say you guys are great and I'll see you next week goodbye bye <laughs>